Okay, we're recording. Okay, so here's where we uh, left off last time. We finished the end of page 8, and so we start here at the start of uh, page 9. But before we get into that, I want to remind you all real quick, um, this is the uh, the lecture schedule uh, on the Sakai site. Keep in mind the, the one for my sections, right, not the, the one for the entire course. Um, and uh, this lecture schedule shows uh, various things about uh, the, the logistics of the course, including... Uh, a definition of what's going to be on each homework assignment and when it's due. So notice homework one here. Uh, we've already filled in uh, that uh, on uh, the first day of class we finished section 1.6. Uh, and then on uh, Friday we finished uh, the, whoops, these sections 1.1 one, one, and 1.2. One, um, and then today, Wednesday, January 18th, this is our last day of material that is included as uh, homework one material. So whatever we finish today will go into this cell right here, right? And um, I'm uh, expecting it'll be uh, 1.3 comfortably and almost certainly not 1.4. Um, so uh, whatever goes in here, though, we'll wait until class is over. And it's, well, actually, I have to wait until my last class of the day is over because everybody's I got to keep all sections on the same, uh, just one second, uh, at, on the same pace. Whatever goes in here, that will finish the definition of what is homework one, right? And it's due Friday of this week. Okay, yeah, question. Um, well, two things. Do we have to do that AHP problem? Yeah, everything that's on the content syllabus. Okay. Yes, absolutely. Where do we submit the homework? Uh, Gradescope, um, which uh, the, the item for submitting on Gradescope is, hasn't yet been created because the you know, in order to create the item, we have to know exactly what's due, and that hasn't been uh, defined yet. So, uh, probably either tonight or tomorrow morning, something like that. Uh, the grade scope item will be created, and that's where you'll submit. Yeah, that's right. Yes. I saw something. It was like only five questions on the grade. Correct. Can you clarify that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, we just. I mean, the simple point is, we just don't have <laughs> the labor needed to grade all of your work on all of the questions uh, of the assignment. There's just not enough. Um, so what we're going to be doing is just uh, picking five uh, and uh, and grading just those. So roughly speaking, what's going to happen is uh, the grand total assignment is going to be broken up into five chunks, each of which you will submit as a grade scope question. Right? I have to kind of lie to Gradescope and tell it that this is one question. It's actually going to be a bunch of exercises, right? Uh, like, for example, all of 1.6 might be like one of the one of the one of the questions on Gradescope. So, uh, which one of those will be graded uh, won't be revealed, <laughs> of course. Um, and uh, but uh, then after the homeworks are submitted, then uh, the, the one that we're picking to grade will get graded, and all the others will be ignored. Yeah. Is that good enough? Yeah, okay. Anybody else? Everybody's happy. Okay. All right. So, uh, yeah, so be on the lookout for the item to be created on Gradescope uh, in the next uh, 24 hours, pretty much. Um, and make sure to submit by uh, note all homework due date times or 11 p.m. Eastern. That's... Uh, so 11 p.m. our time, uh, and uh, the homework due date is January 20th. Okay, all righty. So now let's get back into the math. Um, so we talked about one of the big differences between equations and parameterizations is that equations test points, whereas parameterizations very differently generate points, and these are very much not the same thing. So uh, let's talk now about lines uh, in space. And, uh, well, we know how to parameterize a line in space, but we can't really write an equation uh, for a line in space because a uh, short version, I mean, typically, generically, if you have an equation involving three variables, a uh, solution set's going to be a surface, not a, not a curve, uh, or not, not a line. So uh, if I want to, if I want something to play the role of an equation, namely if I want a point tester, not a point generator, how would I get such a thing? 
Uh, and uh, there's a real clever little argument. Uh, here's our parameterization. Keep in mind what that parameterization does is it generates points. So let's ask the question, how would I test if I have a point, um, you know, uh, X, Y, Z, and I want to know is that on, is that on my line? A uh, pretty reasonable way to test that point would be to ask, and this is going to sound silly, hey, is there some value of t that generates the point that I'm interested in? Right? If there's a value of t that generates it, then yes, it's on the line. And if there is no value of t that generates that point, then no, that point is not on the line, right? So it's um, um, uh, not a not a deep observation. And now I'm going to make a quick aside here and talk about notation. Uh, Y'all likely have not seen these notations before. This little weird looking sort of a backwards capital E uh, is a shorthand for there is or there exists. Uh, and this... I don't know what to call that, uh, is uh, shorthand for uh, such that or so that. So uh, it's pretty standard mathematical shorthand. And uh, anyway, just FYI, I'm going to be using those kinds of notations a lot. By the way, general rule, if I use a notation that um, you're quite sure you've never seen before, uh, feel free to ask, because very likely it's not just you. Uh, if you see a notation that you know you've seen before, then eh, look it up, right? Um, or you can ask me after class, something like that. Okay. All right. So uh, yeah. So so back to where we were. Let me erase uh, this. Uh, oops. Accidentally got my half my question mark there. There we go. Okay. So a test is: Does there exist a value of t that makes this equation work? And now I'm going to say the exact same thing in a slightly different form. Is there a value of t that makes these three equations work? I claim it's exactly the same thing because if you look at this kind of, if you will, first coordinate equation and just solve for t, you get this, this equation. And if you look at sort of what you might call the second coordinate equation there and solve for t, and you get this equation and likewise the third coordinate equation, solve for t, uh, and you get uh, that equation. So this one vector equation being true is exactly the same as these three scalar equations being true. Same stuff. Okay. All right. Well, now... We have what I claim is actually a pretty simple question. Let's look at this statement right here. Does there exist a value of t that's simultaneously equal to all three of these things? And let's think critically on that. How, how could t equal to three different things? It's just one number. How could one number equal to three numbers? There's only one way that you could possibly have one number t equaling to all three of these expressions, and that is if all three of these things are equal to each other. Right? The only way you can have one thing equal to three things, all those three things have to equal to each other. So notice what I have uh, in the orange now is a point tester. You can take uh, the point that you're interested in testing, take that point, toss it into here, look at both equations, and if both of these equations are satisfied, then yes, indeed, that point is on the line. And if either one of these equations fails to be satisfied, then we lose. It's definitely not uh, on the line, because if, in fact, if, if either one of these equations fails to be satisfied, like if this z expression is different from the other two, well, then, uh, then, my, then t would have to equal to two different things. And again, not possible. Okay. All right. Now, you can turn this around. Uh, what I've uh, written here, uh, roughly speaking, is a path, sort of an argument for turning a parameterization into a point tester, uh, which, by the way, we call the symmetric equations. 
Uh, if you want to turn it around and ask, how do I get from here up to there? What's the argument that allows you to get back there? Or just remember where this symmetric equations came from. They came from the fact that I need these things to be equal because I need them to all possibly be able to equal to a single thing, namely t. And if you take uh, this here, rewrite that as three separate equations, then that is your parameterization. Okay. All right, so um, <clears throat> this uh, may or may not have been covered in Math 218. I'm not sure. But uh, anyway, if it, if it was, then that's a review. And if it wasn't, then that's how that works. Okay, so moving along now to the dot product. I know this was covered in Math 218, fundamental tool of linear algebra. Uh, again, definition. Again, you've seen it before. Um, reminder, there's a lot of stuff in this class. Oh, my gosh, there's so much material in this class. And, I, again, I have to make tough choices on how we spend class time. I can't, you know, cover all the examples and all of the sort of, you know, everything. So uh, this is a topic, uh, large parts of which don't make the cut. Because, again, it's review. You've seen it before. So I'm just going to say, do make sure to review all this stuff about dot products uh, in the book and possibly in your old Math 218 book, if you still have that. Um, and just for uh, uh, cultural broadening and as a, just a reminder, possible interest, dot products are not just interesting because of what you can do specifically with dot products. They are also the model for this much more broad, much more powerful idea of inner products. This is extremely sophisticated stuff, allows you to do uh, just I mean, unpredictably powerful things. Uh, ultimately, for example, one of the big ideas behind image compression is a clever choice of an inner product on a certain vector space. It's pretty cool. So anyway, all comes out of the idea of dot products. All right. Now, I do have one quibble that I want to uh, talk about. It's uh, about terminology. Uh, the book uses these two terms, perpendicular and orthogonal, interchangeably. I don't, uh, I don't think that's a good choice. Uh, they are two different words, and we have two different related ideas. Now, I, I want to first talk about why they're different. Um, there's a geometric idea, and there is an algebraic idea. The geometric idea, we'll talk about that first, is just the idea of perpendicularity, and that this is an old idea. This goes back to high school geometry. Perpendicular means that you have two directions. Two directions define an angle, and that... Perpendicular just means that that angle is a right angle, right? It is not that deep of an idea. Purely a geometric concept. Note, however, in order to talk about perpendicular, you need to talk about angle. In order to talk about angle, you need two clearly defined directions. And in order to have clearly defined directions, you need non-zero vectors. You can't talk about the angle between the zero vector and another vector. The zero vector doesn't define a direction. There is no angle to talk about. Does that make sense? Everybody's happy. Okay. All right. So that's the geometric idea. Now there is a uh, an algebraic idea that is dot product equaling zero, uh, and that of course is very closely related to the idea of perpendicularity. But keep in mind, um, dot product equaling zero makes sense whether the vectors are zero or not, right? Um, so <coughs> one of these things allows the zero vector. Uh, another one of these things cannot allow the zero vector, right? So these are slightly different ideas. They're, they're different sort of, um, you know, uh, context. One is geometric, uh, one is algebraic. And so since we have, however slightly different they are, we have two different concepts and we have here two different words and I think it makes sense to use one word to describe one concept and the other word to describe the other concept call me crazy I don't know I think that makes sense right and uh, so I think it's unfortunate uh, to uh, to blur this distinction and to use these terms interchangeably 
Um, uh, I'm going to make a point not to do that in this class to the, to the best of my ability. I, it is, I, I'm going to acknowledge that it is easy to kind of uh, accidentally say perpendicular when you meant orthogonal. And so anyway, always be on the lookout and uh, do your best on that. Okay. All right. Now, certain things that you may or may not have seen. I'm pretty sure you've seen this one before, but it's so easy to talk about. I just want to uh, acknowledge it. And that is we have a handy-dandy little uh, trick formula for how to turn a vector, a non-zero vector that is, into a unit vector. Just divide by its own magnitude, ultra convenient. Again, presumably you've seen it before. Um, something you may not have seen, this idea of a component. Um, the idea of a component is based on a certain premise, and that is that there is a vector whose job is to define a direction. Right? Vectors have direction and magnitude, but sometimes if you need to define a direction, the easiest way is to kind of overkill a little bit and give something that has both a direction and a magnitude because at least it defines a direction. And that's what you really need. And, you know, Job done and the magnitude is just kind of there for no particular reason. Okay, so if there is a direction that you're interested in and only that direction are you interested in and you know I don't care at all about movement in that direction or in that direction just don't care all, right, all I want to know is about that green direction and then the question comes up of this W vector and I want to know okay not how long is the W vector but to what extent does the W vector point in the given Direction. So I want to know that thing. Right? This is called the component. Yes? What's the difference between that and the projection of W on? That's a great question. I'm going to get to that uh, on the next page. So for the moment, uh, I'm going to defer your question. I'll get I'll totally get to that on the next page. Yeah, great question. Okay, so we've got a vector W. I want to know just the part that points in the V direction, how long is that? Okay, easy example if, if you have previous familiarity with the game of football. Um, if uh, the ball starts here and then there's a pass and you get tackled and the ball's down there, how many yards of a gain is that? Is that this many yards gain? No, 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 no. It doesn't, it, if you, the ball goes to, the extent the ball goes to the side, it's irrelevant. You don't get a first down because you throw the ball sideways 10 yards, right? Uh, it's only the part in the relevant direction. So it is the component that defines the yardage gain. Yeah, sports reference. If you, if you don't if you don't know football, don't worry about it. Okay. All right. So uh, how do we compute the component? There's an easy argument we can make using trig. Uh, notice that that distance, the magnitude of W, is the hypotenuse of a right triangle. And notice that. Uh, the component that we're interested in is one of the sides of that right triangle. And notice then that their ratio is the cosine of this angle in that right triangle. Right? Real simple trig. We write down this equation. And then from there, we can do some clever algebra. Uh, it's um, a matter of writing down the formula for component. Let's see here. Uh, did it colors? Uh, uh, there is, well, anyway, uh, we cross multiply to get to this equation, and then the the slick move is to multiply and divide at the same time by the magnitude of v, which seems like a weird waste of time. But if you do that, notice that the nice punchline is that the numerator turns exactly into a dot product. And so uh, what we end up with then, very convenient formula, components can be computed by that very simple formula. And it's like the trig just disappeared. What really happened is that the trig that goes into components and the trig that goes into dot products are exactly the same trig and we kind of, we hid this trig inside of that trig, if, if you will. Okay. So very convenient uh, result there. Is everybody with me? All right. 
Um, now, there's another way to write this, and I think this is very handy. Uh, notice that uh, we have here, the way I have highlighted in yellow here, I have a unit vector. So rather than thinking about this expression as a dot product divided by a magnitude, think of it instead as a dot product with a unit vector. So whatever my original vector is, I'm dotting it with a unit vector. And this leads to a, a very nice uh, pithy rolls off the tongue uh, summary here, and that is that components are dot products with unit vectors. I think it's a really nice way to think about it. This is how I remember the formula. Um, it's, it's really easy to accidentally forget, oh gosh, is it V dot W divided by the length of, oh gosh, is it divided by the length of V? Is it the length of W? Which one do you divide by? Easy to forget. Um, the easy way to remember it, in my opinion, is that the direction is defined, the direction that you're interested in the component, defined by a unit vector, so you just dot with that unit vector. Makes it a lot easier to remember. Okay. All right, how are we doing? Everybody's good? All right. Okay, so you asked a question earlier about projection. So here's the difference. It does have a lot of similarities. Note the picture looks almost exactly the same. Notice we have a vector whose job is to define the relevant direction. Then we have a vector... Uh, w of which we want to know, if you will, in some sense, kind of how far does it point in the relevant direction. The difference is that the projection, rather than being the length, the projection is the actual vector. So that's the main difference between a projection and a component. A component, a projection is a vector, a component is a scalar. All right, so how are we going to find this projection? Uh, there's different ways you can think about it. Here's my personal favorite. Um, keep in mind that you can define a vector if you know, let's see, I'm making color choice. If you know a unit vector defining what direction it points, and by the way, we do, right? And if you know a formula for the uh, for the magnitude indicating how far to go in that direction, which by the way we do right that that uh, that scalar part of the vector we're looking for is literally the component. Right, so we know this we know the direction we know the magnitude, and then all to, and of course the formula for the component is this. We also have a formula for unit vectors. You could write that down, I suppose. But the nice convenient way to sort of I think the most convenient way to write this down is like so um, and uh, this formula here I think uh, easiest to remember as you see it's scalar times unit vector the uh, the scalar is a component the unit vector is well the unit vector so, there you go okay did I answer your question from before? yeah, yeah. Anybody else on this? Okay. There, there is another way that you can write this formula. The book has a uh, uh, an equivalent formulation that uh, I think is weirder myself. But uh, if you like it, that's fine. Uh, they rewrite this as this. And the way they get there, of course, is by plugging in for what the unit vector is. The unit vector is V divided by the magnitude of V. And so is this unit vector, V divided by the magnitude of V. So if you plug that in and you kind of move things around a little bit, then you get this alternative formulation. Now, which would you prefer between these two options? Uh, I like this one. Uh, because, for one thing, it's less characters. It's easier to remember, right? But also, it's more uh, rememberable. It's more, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, it, it transparent. Because I can see right here in the formula that I'm talking about a direction and a magnitude, and furthermore, that the direction is something I have a pre-existing formula for, I've already memorized. And this component is a pre-existing formula I've already memorized. So this one leaps off the page. This one is, you couldn't forget this if you tried, once you understand it. 
get once you understand it, right? But uh, this formula down here, um, you know, he asked the question, uh, what does this thing mean? And well, yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not a natural thing in the story. It's yes, it is what that coefficient ends up being, but it itself, by itself, is uh, not particularly interesting. So I like the first formula better. The book likes the second formula better. Make sure to understand both, and then uh, take your pick. Okay, everybody happy? Yeah. Yes. Are we ever going to use hat notation to describe unit vectors, or like will the book, or I, is this notation? Used? I mean, I don't really care. Um, it, it doesn't. I mean, it's that's. If you don't ever use hat notation, then nothing ma nothing goes wrong. Right? You don't actually need it. Um, if you like it, go ahead. Uh, I rarely, if ever, bother, right? Um, if uh, a vector in question is a unit vector, such as uh, this one is, I will have said so at some point previously. Um, and uh, yeah, I just, I just can mostly just don't don't bother with it. Yeah, is that cool? Yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. All righty. Okay, last thing before we go on to 1.4. Um, <clears throat> there are some facts of plane geometry uh, that are much more inconvenient to deal with with high school techniques and much easier uh, with vector algebra. Um, so uh, the, one of the big ideas here is if you have a line segment, you can view that line segment as eh, like a static thing by itself or you can represent it by a vector, right? And the big advantage to representing it as a vector is that if you write it in terms of vectors, then you can write the, the large part of what the picture is with vector algebra. Algebra is a good thing. Algebra allows you to manipulate things and uh, rewrite things in different ways and realize that you know by way of vector algebra sometimes that certain things are equal that otherwise wouldn't obviously be equal. Um, so uh, there's a couple of examples in the book uh, for how you can uh, how you can use vector algebra to prove certain facts of plane geometry. Again, tough choices and all that. Um, I think this stuff is highly readable, and so I'm going to leave that to you all to read. So uh, give those a look. And I think there's a homework exercise on this as well. Okay. All right. So that's 1.3. We're going to move on now to 1.4. Uh, real quick, I will point out that the order in which I present these ideas is pretty different from the order that the book presents these ideas. Um, there are different <laughs> pros and cons to different orders of presenting these ideas. Um, I feel like the order that I present them makes the arguments more geometric and more convenient. Uh, I think there's less ugly uh, in my my uh, exploration of these ideas uh, than there is in the books. And of course you get to make that call for yourself, decide for yourself. I encourage you to read both, right? And um, and then ask yourself which one was uh, less painful. <laughs> and I think you'll, I, anyway, I, I like my presentation better. Okay. So the first thing I want to do, is I want to talk about something that happens in the plane. Um, we'll, we're going to work our way up to the cross product eventually. Right now, we're just in the plane. And I want to talk about something called an ordered list. Um, the most important thing about an ordered list is the ordered part of it. An, a list is not the same as a set. Uh, a set is just, for example, two things. Neither one's first, neither one's second. They're just kind of there. Right? There is no order that's part of it. An ordered list means that they go in the in the order as listed. In other words, that A is viewed as being first, and that B is viewed as being second. Right, so ordered. So the thing about it is then, um, <clears throat> given an ordered list, uh, we can ask about the order itself, not just not the pair of vectors but the order in which they're written down. What can we say geometrically about the order? And uh, let's. Uh, there's a couple of pictures uh, uh, demonstrating a couple of cases. Uh, now remember, A is first. Okay, so there's A, it's first. 
And uh, let's see, B is second. So here's B, it's second. And this order of A first, B second, I think it would be pretty reasonable to call that a counterclockwise order. Because if you're starting at A and going to B, that action of going from A toward B is intrinsically counterclockwise. Everybody see what I mean there? Okay. Now, on the other hand, I mean, here's a, here's a different ordered list, um, different vectors. I'm going to use also A and B. Keep in mind, A is first, uh, B is second. We're talking about that same, you know, A comma B. B is second. And here, again, going from A toward B is intrinsically clockwise. Right? So if, when you have an ordered list, the order itself, you can generically think of as being either a counterclockwise or clockwise based <coughs> on which of these pictures are we, uh, are we actually looking at in the geometry. Pause for questions. Is everybody clear on what I mean there? And now the bad news is that sometimes uh, neither. Uh, sometimes it's neither clockwise nor counterclockwise. And so you have these ugly pictures like this. I mean, it's neither clockwise nor counterclockwise. They're, they're pointing in the same direction. There's no turning at all. Um, there's another version of this where maybe one of the vectors is the zero vector. Maybe they're both the zero vector. Uh, just, you know, anomalous weirdo kind of stuff like that. Um, in all of which... The vectors are dependent, linearly dependent. So these are the three possible um, uh, states of an ordered list uh, of vectors in, in R2, counterclockwise, clockwise, or the catch-all other uh, linearly dependent. Everybody good? All right. Now, this is a, uh, an arbitrary definition. And whenever you make an arbitrary definition, you kind of owe the listener an explanation of why are we making this arbitrary definition? Why is this interesting? And I'm going to point out some neat properties that this has. Um, uh, these are what I'm going to call mirror images of each other in the sense that if you uh, have a pair of vectors, a, b, oh gosh, uh, a, b, a comma b, notice that is counterclockwise. For example, and if you were to then reflect over a line, notice that the reflection uh, a prime to b prime clockwise. So, a uh, pithy, convenient way to say this is that clockwise and counterclockwise are mirror images of each other, or you could say that they're reflections of each other, and um, that's that's natural and simple and it makes it seem like maybe these ideas clockwise and counterclockwise are themselves natural and uh, you know interesting in some way. okay all right um, another couple of properties and uh, let's go down to uh, this here if you trade the positions of uh, the two vectors. Uh, so by trading, I mean if you put A where B was and you put B where A was, uh, thus resulting in B comma A instead of A comma B. Uh, notice that while the original list, for example, in this case may have been counterclockwise, the act of trading the positions of those two vectors turns the resulting list B comma A B first, A second, to be clockwise. So trading positions changes the order. The picture I drew here shows counterclockwise going to clockwise. You can imagine a uh, similar but different scenario where it goes from from clockwise to counterclockwise. Okay. All right. Is everybody happy with that? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, Neat fact, order is independent of rotations. So if we have, let's say, starting off, we have a counterclockwise order, A comma B, right? If I were to rotate this whole picture, if I were to take both A and B, right, and just kind of rotate the whole picture around, resulting in this picture, 
right? Everything got rotated by the same amount. You rotate the whole thing around and the resulting vectors, R of A and R of B, still counterclockwise. And I think this is pretty believable, right? I mean, in other words, if you, uh, I mean, a simple example, if you're looking at a clock, if you turn your head to the side, the clock still runs the correct direction. Right? That's pretty, pretty natural. Okay. How do we feel about this? Everybody's good. Okay. All right. So here's where things get a little unfamiliar, maybe a little weird. And that is, what is the three-dimensional <laughs> version of this? So by uh, of this, <laughs> I'm looking for a way to describe the fundamental geometry associated to the order in which I list three vectors. And again, very, very importantly, I'm not talking about a set of three vectors. I'm talking about an ordered list. A is first, B is second, C is third. Well, whichever one is listed first is first, etc. So how do I de geometrically describe the order when there's three of them in space? And it turns out a really natural way to do this is what I'm going to call right-handed and left-handed. And I'm going to have to do some literal hand-waving to, to explain what I mean by this. Uh, first of all, let me describe right-handed order. Uh, we call it right-handed order because it involves using literally your right hand. Um, there is a particular hand gesture that you have to use. Uh, the the uh, uh, the nature of the hand gesture is uh, fixed; it's non-negotiable. Um, the idea: your index finger has to point parallel to your palm. Your middle finger has to bend the way that middle fingers want to bend. So no no fair doing. Stuff like this. Okay. So index parallel to the palm, middle finger bending the way it wants to. Right? And then you ask the following question. Index pointed in the direction of the first vector. Keep in mind our first vector is A. Index pointed in that direction. Middle finger bending the way it wants to. Middle finger pointing in the direction of the second vector. Second vector is B. Those two vectors define a plane, and your thumb of your right hand points on a well-defined side of that plane. And again, I know you could force your thumb, okay, but, you know, play fair. Um, your natural position of your thumb points on a well-defined side of that plane. If the third vector, C, points in the same side of the plane as your thumb, then we call that a right-handed order. And so again, here's my here's the hand gesture applied to that uh, this arrangement of vectors here, showing that A, B, C is right-handed order. Everybody on board? Everybody see the, the gesture, etc. Okay. Now on the other hand, let's look at this next uh, set of vectors here. Let's look at uh, this arrangement of vectors. Again, thinking of them in that order. And let's ask the question, is this a right-hand order? Now, it's tempting to say, well, uh, no, because uh, look, if I, if I point my index finger in the direction of the A vector, then I, I mean, I just can't bend my middle finger toward B. But check it out. Yes, you can. Watch this move. You can, you're perfectly allowed to twist your hand around however you want and then you can, with your hand in this arrangement, look, I've got my index finger in the direction of A and my middle finger in the direction of B. But now, see, my, my thumb is pointing on the bottom side of the plane. The third vector, C, is pointing on the top side of the plane. So this is not right hand order. Everybody with me? But check it out. It is left hand order. Right? Index, first finger, uh, first vector. Middle, bending the way it wants to. Thumb, same side of the plane as the third vector. So in the same way that clockwise, counterclockwise are, you know, other than the anomalous sort of annoying weirdo cases, pretty much everything's either clockwise or counterclockwise. In the same way, any ordered list of three vectors in space you know, again, we're going to have to worry about counterexamples, but I mean, generically, most of the time, right-handed or left-handed. One 
the other. Okay. All right. Uh, now we do have to talk about the third possible case, uh, and uh, that is. Uh, where something goes wrong, uh, and there's various different versions of it. I drew a case here where the, the vectors are all parallel to the same plane. And if you were to play the game here and just try to ask if these are, uh, you know, uh, right handed <coughs> or left handed, well, C doesn't point on either side of the plane. And so it's neither right nor left. So this is one of the annoying sort of other. Uh, cases And what you'll find is that even though there's lots of different versions of other, there's lots of different versions of right or left, right and left, both failing. They're all parallel to the same plane. Two of the vectors parallel to each other. Uh, one of the vectors is the zero vector. Two of the vectors are the zero vector. Various different uh, cases. The thing is, they're all linearly dependent. So again, nice little catch-all term there. And I'm going to say then that these are the three possibilities. These are the only three possibilities, right, left, and dependent. Everybody on board? All right. All right, and I claim further that just like clockwise counterclockwise has the mirror image property, the trading changes the order property, independent of rotations property, right and left have that same collection of features. So uh, right-handed and left-handed are mirror images of each other. Easy sort of physical you know, gesture demonstration, right? Right hands and left hands are mirror images of each other. Um, if you trade the position of two of the vectors in the list, Um, then what was right hand becomes left hand. So, again, let's kind of walk through this. Um, A, B, C, you see this this uh, arrangement of vectors here. A first, B second, C third is in right hand order, right? But if I were to change the, or change the ordering, put B first, A second, then my right hand thumb is going the wrong direction. But my left hand thumb is just fine. Right? So right hand turns into left hand. Everybody happy with that? And again, rotations don't make any difference. Uh, and so, you know, again, this is a um, pretty easy hand wave. Um, if uh, this is my initial arrangement of the vectors, if I rotate all the vectors the same way, still right-handed because, in fact, whenever I take my right hand and rotate it, my right hand remains my right hand, right? So uh, pretty pretty, uh, pretty believable, I think. How are we with that? <laughs> okay. Okay, now there's a fourth property um, that uh, there kind of is no two-dimensional version of this, and so you can't really even ask this question. Uh, I mean... Anyway, it becomes something else, but uh, relevant different property for three dimensions is this thing called cycling. Um, and cycling means that uh, everything kind of moves over one notch. Oh, I ah, missed. Everything kind of moves over one notch. So C goes to where B was, B goes to where A was, and then A goes around back to where C had been. Right, thus making, for example, uh, and a neat fact, whenever you cycle, that preserves the order. And if you're interested in a hand-waving, you know, what is, what's, why is this geometrically satisfying? Here's uh, my favorite uh, version of this argument, and that is if this is the argument that ABC is right-handed, just do this, right? So this is what the cycling looks like. And again, this cycling still a right hand. So the handedness is preserved. Okay. How are we doing? Okay. All right. So um, um, I hope you may have seen these facts in linear algebra. Uh, so I eh, may have seen them in, in linear algebra. Maybe, maybe not. Oh, but I, mm, hopefully. Determinant 
has some really powerful properties that actually relate to this order business. And that's why I had to talk about order before I could get into these properties that determine it, because it's about order. So uh, there's a lot to say here. Uh, here I have a list of vectors, uh, A first, B second. And I'm going to take this list and I'm going to do several things. For one thing, I'm going to take the first vector. Oh, whoa, wrong colors. I'm going to take the first vector, make it my first column, second vector, make it my second column, and therefore my list turns into a matrix. Now, that's just a choice. This is a, I'm just going to do this because I want to. Uh, this is not, I, I'm not saying that the list is the same as the matrix. I'm saying you can use a list to generate a matrix in this way. You also know that when you have a matrix, you can define a linear transformation. And once you have a linear transformation, I'll point out that you can ask what happens when I stick the unit square into that linear transformation. So there's our unit square, and I want to remind you that uh, when you apply, well, let's see, let me get the picture drawn first. If you have a standard basis vector, right? If you put a standard basis vector into a uh, linear transformation, if you multiply a matrix times a standard basis vector, this is uh, this is one of the uh, basic facts of matrix multiplication. Matrix times standard basis vector gives you the corresponding column, right? And of course, we know what the corresponding column is. That corresponding column, by construction, is the first vector in the list. And so that purple E1 edge vector turns into this green A vector from the original list. And again, I'm just, I'm just making stuff here. I haven't really, I haven't said anything that I'm going to do with these yet. Right now I'm just making things. Um, and then uh, let's see, likewise, um, we can talk about uh, E2 is the other edge here. And we could ask what happens when you take E2 and put that in there. I'm multiplying the A matrix times E2. Again, that gives you a column. In particular, this is E2. It's the second standard basis vector. So I get the second column, namely the second vector in my list, whatever that is. B, apparently. OK. Everybody with me? So I've defined several things. I haven't said anything about these several things. I'm just noting that I have these several things. Um, all right, so here's the, the first statement. And this is, I, I think, quite a shocker. If you take that matrix and look at its determinant, and if you take this parallelogram that we just defined... defined by A and B being therefore the image of the standard uh, of, of the uh, unit square very closely related the determinant and the area almost exactly the same the only difference is you have to take the absolute value of the determinant so it's it's, it's slightly sloppy to say determinant gives you area but uh, the absolute value of the determinant So I'm curious, how many people saw this in Math 218? Okay, good. All right, so um, some of you may have uh, uh, seen it and maybe forgotten it. Maybe it was a long, it might have been at the very start of the term, something like that. Okay, so I think this is shocking that area, and if you look at this parallelogram and ask yourself how would you compute this area, uh, the first thing you do is you need to take the magnitude of A, which involves square roots. Where's the square root in this formula? This is just talking about determinant. Three function arithmetic, right? That times that minus that times that. It, there's no square roots in the formula on the left. There's definitely at least one square root in the formula on the right. Also, you're going to need to drop a perpendicular here, which means you're going to need to do trig to figure out that length. Where is the trig in this formula? I ask rhetorically. So it just doesn't, it seems too good to be true. How could this possibly be correct? 
Uh, but it is, in fact, true. Everybody with me? Okay, and I'm, let's see. i got to look at the clock here. Oh, my gosh. I am already out of time. Shoot. Okay. Right, because 235, let's see, 145. Yeah, that's right. We're out of, we're out of time. All right, we'll pick up here on, um, on Friday. See you all later. Have a good one. Okay.